So, good morning. My name is Jim Elliott. I'm with uh, Glasshouse Systems. Uh, Glasshouse Systems is an IBM uh, key business partner in Canada, uh, the US, the Caribbean, and Egypt. Uh, we're, we're the easy business partner for Egypt, which is sort of weird. Um, but uh, I've been working on uh, VM since the beginning. Uh, I spent 42 years and eight months at IBM before retiring at the end of January 2016 and moving into this role. Uh, where I'm still doing VM and uh, more Linux than that. And unfortunately, now I'm doing VOS stuff, but you know, I'm just here. Um, so, I need to stand over here so I can see it. So, 2022 is the 50th anniversary, 55th anniversary of CP40 going into production. So, I'll give a little history of the predecessor of VM here. And of course, the 50th anniversary of the VM270 on August 2nd uh, of that year. Uh, back when they used to announce things around the time of share. So, really great to be a share for it. Um, so, we're going to look at the evolution of virtualization over the decades. But when I say that, I don't really mean it because it's really about the first two decades. The chart deck is 65 charts. I'm not presenting them all. Most of them are there for history. So, anything past about SP4, SP5, uh, read the charts. You can find out the details. I'm really interested in the history of it. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, the full presentation is out on the website. I also will tell you there's a lot of links at the end of it, and there's hot links throughout it. A lot of the documentation I referenced in the bibliography, I realized preparing this, going through it this week, um, most of the links don't work anymore. But I have downloaded all the documents. So I put them up onto Google Drive and made them public. So all the docs are linked in there, and you can download all the historical information. Um, note that this is uh, this is the MSPR six. So you guys didn't get that far. Um, not an exhaustive presentation, so read the bibliography. So throughout the history of VM or of IBM, um, history of VM, I use groundbreaking virtualization software, as we like to say. There are some key design principles. So this is some of the IBM marketing stuff here. Um, it's all about uh, the virtualization hypervisor called the control program. We called that since the beginning. Um, interfaces for virtual machines to interact, uh, management services and all the system services. And you can run thousands of virtual machines. Now, all of you who work with VM know that, but we've been able to do it since the beginning. I like to think back to one of my first customers as an SE, a company called Imperial Oil. Uh, this is the Canadian unit of Exxon. And they ran 1,400 cross users on a 4 meg 3081. Or sorry, 3083. A 4 megabyte 3080. 1,400 users. There's no Intel server in the world that can run 1,400 images. Um, and they were all using it pretty heavily. And of course, we can overcommit resources. You know, that's one of the great things overcommitting memory in these things. Uh, so it's very adaptable, and that's one of the reasons it's continued along. So let's go back in history here. So 1961, John McCarthy of uh, MIT proposed this idea for a time-sharing computer system. As far as I can find, he's actually the guy who came up with the word time-sharing uh, for this. Uh, and as you can see down the bottom, there's a link there to a couple of papers on it, uh, where you can find out there was uh, some history documents of it. So IBM built a computer for them system, and IBM 709, which was a second generation mainframe. Later on, they upgraded to a 7094, which was just a faster version of it. Um, used IBM 1050 terminals, 1052. Uh, most of you, well, some of you are pretty young in this room. Um, a 1052 was basically an IBM selector typewriter, but it connected up uh, to the computer. Um, it had three terminals. You got three concurrent users. That was pretty fancy in those days. Um, and so in 1961, later on in the year, MIT decides to build a system. So they built something called CTSS, Compatible Time Sharing System, running on that 7094. Uh, one of the neat ones I found at the same time, Frankie Packard, which later became Imperial Computers Limited in the UK, uh, using a seven, uh, sorry, uh, developed a system called One Level Store for Atlas. And Atlas was really neat and was only at the bottom because it was the first machine that had the concept of uh, pages for this, um, and the pages were 512 words, 
I haven't been able to find the word size. I think it was probably 16 bit, might have been 32. With a 32 page memory and a 200 page drum. So, 200 page drum, so that would have been, you know, 50K. Not a really big uh, storage device by today's standards, but it was the first one that did paging. Um, IBM in 1962, the research guys got it along, and they, at that point there was a machine called the 7044. Uh, if you want to see a bit about the history of mainframes, look on my blog and you can find the mainframe history presentation that I do, uh, where I go through the whole family tree. And these, IBM kept on putting out new mainframes on a very regular basis as minor changes. Uh, so they created this machine, so 7044 was virtual storage, called it an M44, and has something called the Modular Operating System. This is the predecessor to CP. Um, and there was another, this was, uh, so research did this, then there was an advanced systems development division. Uh, they modified a 7090 to add relocation. And uh, 1963, DSD, data systems division, that's the Kipsey Endicott, um, modified a 7040, 7044 users to run in a port, Fortran environment. And this was the first product virtualization product from IBM, something called QuickTran. Uh, you can find the user's guide down there. I actually managed to find the user's guide on the web. Um, and so 40 users, again, on 1052s, uh, again, it looked like a selectric typewriter, used an acoustic coupler. Anybody remember an acoustic coupler? Yeah. Um, 134 bits per second, something like that on it. Um, but that's a picture, by the way, of a 7044. Nice ancient partner. Um, so I mean, okay, I'm going to stand over here. Um, so, so IBM uh, came along, and uh, Fred Brooks. Uh, some of you guys may remember the name Fred Brooks. He was head of mainframe development and that sort of thing at the time. Um, and Gene Amdahl, who was the architect of all the mainframes at the time from IBM, or one of the architects. Um, they went up and met with MIT, and MIT wanted this machine custom built for them to do running CTSS. IBM was not interested in building a custom machine. They wanted them to do more general purpose stuff. So MIT went off and decided to buy a machine from GE. GE used to make computers. There was a whole bunch of companies back then. We had IBM and the Seven Dwarfs, and then it became IBM and the Bunch. Rivers, Univac, NCR, Control Data, Honeywell. So I guess GE and RCA were the other two that made up the seven dwarfs at the time. Um, Bell Labs also went with that. Uh, so IBM was not happy about this, of course. So uh, you know, Ben Learson, who was president of IBM at the time, and Arthur Watson, Dick Watson, who was um, his brother Tom was chairman, Arthur was chairman of World Trade. Uh, they weren't happy about this. Um, did not like losing. Uh, so, at about the same time, IBM merged ESD and ASDD into SDD. IBM likes changing development that division names on a regular basis. Um, so, in August of 65, IBM actually announced the 36067. It was a modified 36065 with a DAT box. And a DAT box was an entire frame, about two feet, about uh, two feet by about six feet high, just to do dynamic address translation. <laughs> And the operating system announced with it was TSF, Time Sharing System. Uh, you want a nice history thing? This is the manual, Concepts and Facilities Manual for TSF. I've been carrying this around for decades because I actually used it. Um, the, only one, it's the oldest manual I have from IBM. Um, and TSS was a really fantastic system, but it was developed by Poughkeepsie. So it was very OS 360 oriented. So it had ECDs, and it had all those things you remember. But I do want to mention, it had brought one really great thing to the world, and that was DSAM. Because the file system, and it was called BAM, Virtual Access Message Method, which had VSAM, Virtual Sequential, VSAM, Virtual Index Sequential, KSDS and VSAM terms, and Virtual Partitioned Access Method, which was a PDF stuff in the VSAM. Really weird stuff. And it also had some other things that ended up in that it went over the years. Um, so this was their official one. Uh, TSS released it in October 67, and I had a couple of customers as a young IBMer who used it. 
But then IBM decided to replace it with TSO. And so, but TSS didn't die. It continued on for years and years. I forget who the last customer was. I know that uh, uh, Bell Northern Labs ran it, but they moved to VM a long time before. But it continued on. So that was the official thing. But we got to look back um, some other stuff out there. MTS, Michigan Terminal System. I mean, you guys work on MTS as a younger? Yeah. MTS was a great thing because UBC had it, Simon Fraser had it out of Vancouver, where I'm from originally. Um, we had a lot of universities using it. It became very popular. Um, it worked on a dual processor, dual processor model 67. You could have a uni or a dual. 360s were designed to go up to a four way, almost none of them were ever built that way, but there were two way 67s. And as I said, UBC had it, Simon Fraser. Um, and in fact, this was one of our first experiences because um, UBC was running TSS on 67 at IBM. We were hosting it. Uh, they decided they didn't like TSS, so they went to MTS instead, and IBM said, you can't do that on our hosted system, so they put their own machine in. So that's how I got my hands on my first virtual storage machine at IBM. Um, so then along, sort of in parallel to this, the Cambridge Scientific Center guys were doing over to work, and they created uh, modified 360 model 40 to 467 to add virtual storage. And the way it was done, so that they had four goals to do research into time sharing, hardware requirements, development and operating system for internal use, and then figuring out monitors. So uh, they had this attachment. So Jerry Blau created something that was known at the time as the Blau Box, which became the Jack Box because I think mean, it doesn't use using people's names and products. Um, well, I said, except it, unless you own the company. Uh, uh, so there were two components, CP40 um, and Cambridge Monitor System, which is the direct ancestor 30 generations back of today's CMS. Um, and it could actually run bare metal. You didn't need to run it on the CP40. CMS was a single user bootable operating system. Don't know anyone who ever did it. But you could do it. Uh, and you could run 12 virtual machines on CP40. So at that point, you know, IBM took the Blau box, put it into the 67, and released the 67 with TSS. Well, the Cambridge Scientific Center rewrote uh, CP40. Uh, the control record was almost a complete rewrite to CP67. CMS was still the same. I love it that the kernel was 80 kb. You know, yesterday, you guys weren't, most of you weren't at the VSE session yesterday, but DOS release one, the kernel was 6K. If you only had one partition back then, so 6K. Um, so CP67 only supported the Uniprocessor, never supported the dual model. You could run up to 24 virtual machines, which was, again, pretty damn good. You could run a whole bunch of operating systems, so OS 360, DOS 360, RAX. RAX was an IBM early attempt at time sharing remote access, uh, again, it disappeared pretty quickly. It ended up as some other company bought it and uh, used it in their product. Uh, DOS APL, which was a packaged standalone version of APL. Uh, CMS, and of course, CMS Batch, which for some reason the documentation describes as a separate operating system. That's the way they describe it. And it became really popular. A um, couple of reasons for that, which I like to think is a good reason, it was free. But all software was free back in those days. For the younger people, you don't realize that software was all free. It wasn't open source. No, it wasn't free as in speech. It was more free as in beer. Because um, you bought the hardware and that paid for software at all. Uh, but it became really popular. Universities loved it. Uh, universities started modifying it. And we ended up with masses of function in DM because people modified it and gave the code back. Uh, here's a look at the hardware configuration for this. So, uh, you have you know, memory, CPU for a virtual machine, operator console with a 1052, again, select your typewriter, that's not a 1052 in the picture, had a 1403 printer, 2540 reader punch, uh, 2311s and 2314s, and 2401 tape. This is important to know because there's still that way in VM. You know, virtual machines, we still do to find virtual 1403s and virtual card readers and punches. Um, I seriously doubt that there's any card readers or punches I've found in ECM anywhere in the world. I hope not, at least. Um, CP67 also 
words and things like a 2301 paging device, which is a picture on the right there. I think that has four meg uh, pages in the one we have. Networking controllers, we had 2701, 2702, 2703. And you had this option, and I never saw one in a real customer, but a 2250 as uh, the operator console. And the 2250 was a vector display. I've seen a video of it uh, being used, but it yeah. had light and 2250 was an amazing device. Lighter had one. And we got it working under CMS, and they did air traffic control simulations. We had a, a small aircraft simulator that was connected to VM, and somebody could fly the little simulator, and they had pretend aircraft on the screen, and the function buttons worked, and the light pen worked, Ooh. and it was just an amazing, it was a sophisticated computer in itself, and it was just a wonderful piece of work. Well, the one I had, we had a 2260, which is the predecessor to the 3270 on it. But I saw 2250 is being used for air traffic control over the years. Uh, virtual machines. And this is always fun. So virtual machines in those days always ran in problem state. So you could only use problem state instructions. Any supervised instruction resulted in a priv op. And uh, so the priv ops, I mean, all priv ops were intercepted by CP for handling. Memory was handled by DAF. 256k of memory with the minimum virtual machine size. Uh, my biggest one right now is about 8 gig. Um, two mini disks with an optional third. So you had a 190, still got that. 191, user disk, and 192, which was temporary disk. So you only had the three. You didn't have all the other ones in that. And they did have letters, by the way. Um, the operator console was a virtual 1052. The, Virtual 2540 uh, reader punch. Um, the fascinating thing about that box, that's the, that's the right button, that's the, yeah, 2540 on the right there. VM, when we added accounting into VM, which it didn't have initially, um, it punched the accounting cards into the middle hopper. The punch was on the left, the reader was on the right, and all of a sudden a card would just drop into the middle hopper when they were everybody logged off of VM, and that's how accounting records were done. I don't know who got the brilliant idea to actually start writing a bunch of disks instead. Um, and the cost printer, 00 easy and tape at uh, 180. We still have a virtual tape address, this is 180 on. Um, and the disks are still 190. Nothing ever, it was a good idea, why change it? Um, so we supported three minute disks. I mentioned 190 was your S disk, nothing's changed. 191 was your P disk for private, not A disk back then. And then 192 was your T disk for temporary disk. Makes sense. Um, physical block size was 892 bytes, which seems weird, but it was one quarter of a 2311 track. And 2311 is with the disk we use on these. And a 2311 was seven and a quarter megabytes. So the machine I have running CP67, we had six 2311 drives on it. It's really pretty good. We could do an awful lot of stuff with that. Um, you could also use uh, 2314s, they were 28 meg, 20 max, so five, that's possible. I think there were 28 megs on a 2314 cartridge, uh, I can't remember. Um, uh, compilers, we had a lot of compilers, most of them from OS360, because CMS looked like OSTCP for this. Uh, some of these languages you remember, but some of you don't remember, like Snowball. If you remember programming in Snowball, uh, script is still around, Docker Composition Facility. Uh, some others I've never run into, but like Bruin, uh, Brown University, and Exec was there, Edit was there. By the way, this is not the edit we love today. This was a line mode editor. Any of you old enough to remember Edlin on DOS? This was Edlin. It's really pretty bad. When we were Doing the demo, Richard Lewis, I remember, I think it was the Linux world. We got the mainframe set up and something went wrong. And somebody configured TCPIP on VM one. They put like an asterisk in column one. TCPIP didn't like that because it had to be a pound size one. So we had to go in line mode on the HMC to edit the profile TCPIP to get it back up. And Richard and I are going, like, God, I can't remember exactly how to do this now. It's been so many decades. But we did get it working. Um, there were lots of utilities. Um, interactive access by a 2741, either acoustic coupler or you could have some phone lines. Uh, 
IBM had a system back then called Home Hands-On Network Environment, which was used by the field people, and it was 2741s, and in our branch we had wooden box acoustic couplers with a phone, and that's how we connected into you. My first manual I wrote, which was a DOS BS BSAM red book, we did on a basically a 2741 teletype editing the script files with edit. It's not a good experience, uh, not a good memory. Um, and then uh, input output was by a thing called a 2780, which later got replaced by a 360 model 20, which was CPU remote. That got replaced RSCS. Here's the original announcement letter. That's the entire thing, three pages. Any of, any of you read IBM announcement letters these days? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're lucky if it's 100 pages. Uh, most of it's in C feature codes. Uh, but this was the whole thing, and by the way, this announced three releases of VM all in one. <laughs> it was, you know, it was incredible how small I could do these things back then. And they were also all signed back then by the um, So my introduction again, Western Region Computing Center in Canada. IBM, uh, back in those days, uh, this was before we had high-speed networking. So we had computing centers in every single city, pretty very much. So Western Canada, we had eight computing centers in seven cities. Uh, most of the machines were pretty small. There were 360s running DOS. We had a 360-75 in Calgary running OS 360, and uh, a 50 in Vancouver running OS 360. But we had the 67 there that UBC had been using and wasn't anymore. So they said, well, let's make it the MVS machine, the OS 360 machine, and they got rid of the Model 50. Uh, but they still had the 2311s that were there from TSS. And uh, the machine was only used for batch processing, you know, Monday morning to Friday night, and it was quiet again. Yeah. And I was the system programmer at the time for the Vancouver lab. So IBM had a Vancouver DOS development lab in those days. Uh, we had a 360 model 40 with the DOS 360, and DOS VS had been announced. And so we were going to get a 37145 to run VM370 and DOS VS. And they said, Jim, here on the weekends you can play around with the 67 and bring up CP67 to learn some of the concepts. So I never ran production, but I did bring it up and played around with it and played with TSS at the time. It was a nice sort of way to learn things. Uh, by the way, R67 had one mega memory on it. Each 2P6K was a frame that was 8 feet by 2.5 feet by 6 feet high of core memory, very right cores. It was fun stuff. I remember we upgraded the 758K in one day and we started doing thermal checks. And Poughkeepsie sent a guy over and there was a little Rockwell thermostat in the bottom and one of those little skins like that wasn't pushed all the way on so that they heat it up and it would separate and saw the thermal check. We were so embarrassed. Um, so I installed several VM 370 and DOS VS releases over that period from 74 to 78 when I moved to the IBM lab in Toronto. Um, so VM370 was announced, uh, sorry, System370 was announced in June 70, but they weren't virtual storage capable, they were just a new 360. Uh, some of the machines were virtual storage capable, like the 135 and 145, but they weren't announced at that. So I've even announced virtual storage on August 2nd, 1972, with OS, uh, OS VS, VS1, VS2, DOS VS, and VM370. Um, like, uh, by the way, VM370 was never announced to be an end user product. It was announced to help you migrate from OS360 to OSVS. It was supposed to have free releases and die. Thank God it hasn't, right? <laughs> you wouldn't have a job. Um, there were also some additions that they put out there. Um, so it came out with 370s, uh, 135 and 145, 158, 155, 152, uh, 168. Um, as they added support and then later on 165. And these releases came out pretty quickly, as you can see by the timeline on here, as they kept on adding new function in here. Uh, some of the things that came along were RSCS. So there was this function as I mentioned called CP Remote. Um, and it really was designed as an RJE solution, not as an NGE file transfer. Uh, so they built something called SC Node. I haven't been able to find much out about this other than the names of the products. Um, but with VM370, there were a lot of enhancements in the school for CP67. And you could now tag things with information that could be used to forward stuff. So RSCS came out in 1975 uh, as a component of VM370. By the way, VM370 was no charge. This was what they called the Type 1 program back then. So 
So uh, these they put functions in and they charge you for it. Um, so along it came with all these things and they kept on adding the function to it. But they added NJE support, Network Job Entry Protocol, so you could talk to MBS guys and talk to other things. And that became a product, the BNet PRBQ. Uh, the name BNet because the internal RCS network in IBM was called BNet. They decided to name the modified version of RCS that was built for internal use after the internal network. PRPQ is a program that has the price quotation. You can see this was a chargeable product, and this was the first chargeable product for it. Um, there's also, by the way, BitNet, uh, which I think university people in the room here should remember. Uh, when Mark Harris used to run BitNet, I assume. Yep. Uh, and it was basically, and they were all interconnected. You could send emails to each other. It was really great. This was before the internet was. You know, back in those days, the internet was limited to military and education, which you couldn't use for business use. Uh, so at that point, it wasn't there. And we started getting some other add-ons. The uh, first big add-on here was what everyone called the Wheeler Scheduler PR, PRPQ, because Wheeler Scheduler was written by Lynn Wheeler, um, but it was officially the Resource Manager PRPQ. I don't know anyone who ever called it that. It was called, called the Wheeler Scheduler. Um, and it was great. I mean, it uh, improved performance dramatically in the machine. Uh, IBM then decided to make a couple of more products out of this, so they created something called the System Extensions Program Product and the Basic System Extensions Program Product. What was the difference? Well, people complained that SEPP was too expensive, so they took some function out and made a basic version that was cheaper. Uh, IBM has a history of doing this. You know. uh, you'll, we'll get to this later. Um, as an example, but it, so some of you remember BIF, yeah. Uh, I won't talk about BIF, it's in the chart deck. You can read the dirty, ugly history of BIF. Um, so basically these were add-ons to it. Uh, and basically, at this added accounting, yes, you had to pay to not punch things in the middle hopper of the 2540. And you had to pay for software to do that. Uh, swap table migration, page migration, shadow table. Uh, and then Chuck Tesla, who was an SCE out in Los Angeles, wrote the first monitor for VM called VMAP, for VM370 release 5. Um, up until that point, there was no way to find out what the system was doing, how it was performing. This would have gone nuts, you know? You can't, or Romney's line, but if you can't measure it, I don't care. What's the exact wording of that? I forget what Romney's line is for that. Hmm? Barton, sorry, not Romney, Barton. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'll edit that. That was that. Verbal <laughs> slip there. Um, so let's get into the product version. This is when I even started charging for things they called the system products. So BMSP, release one, um, announced it in February 1980, G8 in December. This was not unusual to have almost a year or more between announcement and shipping. Added support for MPs, multi processors. Um, if, you know, you got about a 1.4. On a two way, it didn't perform super well. Uh, they had the support for attached processors. You know, an AP was an interesting, there were some machines back then IBM had that were APs. Uh, they were dual processors, but all the IO was attached to one side. They called it an attached processor, it was cheaper to build. I had a 3031 AP in one of my jobs. Um, they added console communication services, exec2, so we got a, a much nicer language for uh, scripting. Um, still wasn't great, but it was a lot better. Um, I still have some exec2 execs. You know, it does, it's not broken, don't fix it, don't touch it, sort of thing, and they still work. Uh, secondary console image facility, interuser communication vehicle, and the big one here, xedit, so it gets a whole chart. Um, 3278 mod 5 displays. If you remember the Mod 5, was a big widescreen display. 3279, the color display, the first IBM color display. I still have my manual from Kersley Lab on guidelines on how to use color. You know, use red for things that are bad, yellow for things that are warning. Everybody can really Kersley on that one. Um, data streaming on 3380, and one of the big ones, 3800, the first big laser printer uh, from IBM. Uh, that was also known as the PDFs from Hell. Uh, because there were so many PEs in that stuff. Uh, Adolf Cahan, who was one of the guys I worked with at uh, Glasshouse at the time was the Royal Bank as their VM system programming lead, and he would scream at IBM on a daily basis about the PPFs for this stuff that just broke everything. Uh, release 
II was announced a year and a half later and added Prop, programmable operator, something that I think is still a really good tool that a lot of people don't use. Um, and the CMS productivity aids, that's what they call them. So we got Note, you can send emails to people on VM. Uh, send files, send files, uh, receive, read lists, file lists, and exec IO services. A lot of really great things came along in these releases. Uh, release three, which came along in 83, um, again, eight months GA, added Rex. This was the most important thing I ever did up until pipeline. Um, Rex, a fantastic bunch of star block IO, uh, curve for uh, event recording for monitoring system, and CMS by using the, because before it was just a CP function, and so this made it a lot easier to use. So if we look at, let's look at XEdit and Edgar. We can't forget Edgar. Uh, I wish that somebody brought Edgar down from Chicago. Who's got Edgar now? Mike's still got him. He's in Utah now. Oh, okay. you you're tired from being aware. Um, so Edgar, the display editing system, uh, was a full screen editor. Bob Carroll wrote it and came out in 76. And it was a really, really popular editor. It was a, uh, here it was an FTP or IUP, something like that. A great tool that everybody used. And it was our first full screen uh, editor. Uh, at the time, there was another editor, ed ed editor coming out from IBM France. Xavier de Lambertere, Lambertere uh, wrote an editor called XEdit. And uh, so it supported Exec, Exec2, Rex, Exec, so you could modify it and do all kinds of things. It was very customizable, as you know. Uh, there was a little war going on at the time inside IBM. I remember polls that were being done over VNet of which editor should become the official next editor. Uh, and let me tell you, there was like real bad, there were a whole bunch of editors, not just X editor together. There were a lot of them available internally at the time. And so it was a little battle, and X edit won. And so it became the official editor. Uh, a lot of people kept on using Edgar for years and years and years. And there was even some XEdit macros that made XEdit simulate XEdit, uh, simulate Edgar. So, uh, and a lot of people started building applications on XEdit. It was so modifiable. I wrote a whole mass of applications as XEdit applications when I was in the IBM uh, computing center. Uh, next one, props. Hey, first dominant email system in the world. Um, it was the main email system in the world for a long time. So that's a screen image from Office Vision VM, also known as Props version 3. Tracy in the room? I know she's around there. By the way, Tracy had her 38th anniversary with IBM yesterday. She was a little birthday cake for anyway. Um, but uh, so they released it as an RPQ. It was developed by Amico and IBM. Um, Amico wrote for their internal use. Went through a lot of releases of it. Um, added support for the internet. Props extended mail. It was sort of flaky. I remember the first few years of it because you weren't allowed to use the internet for commercial use. Every time you went to send an email with it, it would come with a prompt saying, can you verify that this is not for commercial purposes? And that's the great thing Al Gore did, is he wrote the law that allowed you to use the internet for commercial purposes. It didn't create the internet, but he democratized it so we could use it. Maybe that was good, maybe that was bad, but you know, sometimes I wonder about the internet. Um, and then, IBM came up with Office Vision. Office Vision was going to run on all platforms. So it was an Office Vision 2, an Office Vision MES, Office Vision VM, and the other ones just died pretty quickly and the VM one stayed around. Um, we had people using it until not that long ago. And I know when I was at IBM in Glendale, Endicott Lab Machine still had props on it. We still have them. I believe so. Like, it probably still works and nobody's ever going to remove it. It's still sitting there working. There were said to be a million props users outside of IBM, and IBM was totally dependent on it. That brings us to Rex. Uh, Mike Kolashaw, brilliant IBM, or became an IBM fellow a few years later. Uh, I remember we, we were having, it was one of the universities, I think, at VM, and it was at say, Hilton in San Francisco. And we were doing the VM opening, and Mike was sitting at the back of the room on the floor with his laptop, and nobody had even noticed he was in the room. That's how nondescript he sort of was. Um, but he originally did it. It was Rex with 1X, originally reformed executor, um, weird name. And Mike started doing it in 1932. One of the interesting things was he was sending out the documentation to us across IBM. Before he ever wrote a line of code, he wrote the 
complete reference manual. And that's a weird way of writing language. So he had it all documented and described before he started writing any code. It was thin over the network, became really popular. Um, first publicly described at Share 56 in Houston in 1981. Uh, Ken Johnson from Stanford, then your accelerator said, it like, they were people going nuts over this thing. Uh, so it got released in the product in release three. Uh, and that's a copy of, I think, the second edition cover. I have a second edition one at home, could not find it as I was packing for this trip. I wanted to bring it down as a little show and tell. Uh, then we come to the teddy bear. By the way, the, the two IBM speakers that were here yesterday morning, the executives, they came up to me after and what is this teddy bear thing? <laughs> so I said, we should come to my session tomorrow, you'll hear all about it. Um, but so, all the groups have mascots. So, MBS was officially the eagle. Um, you know, it was officially the eagle. The <laughs> group was the turkey. Um, yeah, they didn't like that. And TSO was an elephant, I think, because it was slow and lumbering and heavy. Um, and, uh, you know, VSE is a cat. You know why VSE is a cat? Nine lives. It's been killed off a couple of times by IBM. Well, now again. Um, so, you know, we needed something. At, uh, so, 1983, a share. Um, we had stickers back then. We had first timer stickers that went on your badge. Um, and so, you got a yellow sticker. And if you're old enough, you got blue stickers. And I don't know if anybody can remember which was which, but I remember. Um, so, Carol Jobush went out and bought a, some of those little cards that are actually a strip of stickers with teddy bears on it. Because uh, identify this warm and cuddly old timers, right? We're warm and cuddly, right? Um, I always thought of it as more as uh, we should look on it as uh, VM as being user cuddly software. I like that term. Um, so the mascot was going through at ten years. So we keep on coming along. So release four came along, and release four added SNA support. I'm doing that time here. Oh, okay, right now. Release four added SNA support, and this was a big thing. Uh, this is, sorry, native SNA support. We had SNA support before then, but you had to run a DOS VS or OS VS1 guest. So now we had native support, native in telephone. Um, uh, release 5 came out uh, in 85. Um, it, it was announced in October 85, GNGA for a year and a half. Not quite sure what happened there. Um, and it added APCVM, Advanced Program and Program Communications for VM, that was a VTAM thingy. Uh, Transparent Services Access Facility and Advanced Function Printing. Oh wow, you fancy, you know, uh, think PDFs for the younger people in the world. Um, added CMS Session Services, full screen CMS, uh, which I still, still use all the time. And people go, it's a full screen CMS? And I went, yeah, and it's really handy because you can scroll backward and forward. Very handy for this. And for good or for worse, added support from Rackat. So I'd be imported Rackat from uh, that time it would have been MBS still, I think, over to VM. Release 6 came along, and this was the last release of VMSP, uh, sort of. Um, added support for the shared file system. Uh, so this is IBM's hierarchical file system that exists inside VM. So instead of media, so you can use SFS. Um, I usually have a mix of the two of them, and the callable services library. Uh, uh, so, as a native SMA sort of came to VM. Um, it had been there for a long time through the VTAM Communications Network Appliance, um, which ran on OSVS1 or DOS VSE um, as a guest. Um, but if you were a VM guy, you had to learn another operating system just to run it. And we had customers running. I'm a pure VM shop, but I have to put a DOS machine in to get to an SNA network. Uh, you know, we didn't have TCP and stuff in those days. Um, I just did it by that point. So uh, what they did is they created a new operating system called Root Control System that ran under VM. So it was sort of analogous to CMS in a way, but it did have some things in it for sharing memory. Uh, so you could do a lot of things that were very MBS-y. Um, basically, it was a simulation of MBS SP 3.1.3, I think was the release number. Um, but sorry, it was a stripped down version of MBS here. Uh, RSCS, they rewrote from being a CMS app, or sorry, from being native, it had a whole operating system in it, uh, to run as a G 
CCSF. Uh, we have the VCAM NCCF available for it, and some utilities like the SSP, which is how you loaded the NCP, which is 37XS. Can you remember SSP substitute support for you? I can't remember. It's been so long. Uh, geez, at, at this point, VM was still all source code. This was, we had the source code battle, source code battle back then, because MBS world had gone all object code only. VM was still source. So since this was MBS code, it was shipped with what they call restricted source. So you could get the source code, but it was written in PLX. And you didn't make a PLX compiler available to customers, so you could look at the source code and do nothing with it. We did, IBM did make PLX available to some ISVs, but that was about it. Uh, CMS session services and full screen CMS. This is a picture from my machine a couple of years ago. Uh, so basically, when you go into it, say set full screen on, and you end up with the screen, the PFP is in the bottom, you can scroll back and forth. Still, a very useful tool if you're doing anything where you want to be able to see what did I just enter without re entering the command multiple times. Um, and you can also use uh, the full screen CMS uses CMS session services. So you can write all kinds of full screen apps. And a lot of people wrote full screen applications using all the functions that were there for it. And you can do it from exec or exec, exec and that sort of thing. Uh, shared file system, hierarchical file system for VM. This again is on my machine. Um, and so you can see I've got a hierarchy, I've got a root, and then I've got all kinds of folders down there. I never throw anything out. So as you can see, I have the Lex source code up there, the iOS 327 source code, my CMS pipelines course that I need to teach. <laughs> Someday, I'm going to want this stuff. So never throw anything out. <laughs> I firmly believe in never throwing anything out. So, yeah, we're pretty good. I've got, I could show a lot more. Um, do you want to show a couple of other things? IBM used to create tons of great collateral. And Christina, great country. This was one of our favorite ones, right sizing. At the time, everybody was talking about right sizing, which is the current, the term that now we say modernizing. You know, it means do stupid things and get off your name break. Um, so somebody came with this whole idea and says right sizing. Uh, VMESA, a brilliant way to run your business. Right sizing, right size with VMESA client server products. So, Landres, you remember Landres? That was Nobel Netware running under VM. Um, Land File Services ESA, which had been originally WLFS, Workstation Land File Services. No, no, that's another product. Um, and Land File Services ESA was basically a simulation of OS2 land server running on VM. And the last one, AdStar Distributed Storage Manager, which started off like this workstation data save facility VM out of the Armand Lab store. Bill, I'm messing up again. Um, and that became Tivoli Storage Manager, and then of course they killed off the VM and the versions of it. Um, what, Tivoli Storage Manager? No. <laughs> <laughs> All of us have those dads. By the way, this is the one. This is the one I use every day. This is I have two of these. I have one on my desk in my condo and one on my desk in my house. Um, yeah. As I mentioned, there's also um, there's also some historical stuff there. So this was a really great publication from Washington. This is there. David Steinhoff wrote this. The VM function guide and basically listed every single function in VM from VM 370 release 1 up to SP3 and HPO4 and VMXA migration 8 as you know, a paragraph on each function that was added. Um, David, before he died, gave me the source code. I never had a chance to finish updating it. Um, and I tried scanning this in for this, but it was unreadable because it's old fonts. I don't, I mean, my OCR scanner had a real problem reading Wants so I converted it into a Word document, and it's up in the, when you go to the reference up here, the um, function guide. So you can actually download a copy of this. Um, and if you really want to see history, because it goes through all kinds of IBM products that came out for VM370 and VMSP, you know, that long gone. Um, so I do want to just quickly finish 
off by going through the bibliography or telling you about some of these things. So, Melinda Varian, mom to us, uh, she wrote a famous paper, What Mother Never Told You About EM Maintenance. Uh, the old timers in the room all remember Melinda very fondly uh, from Princeton University, me and Melinda there. Uh, and her website, she's still got all of the history papers up there, including lots of great presentations and stuff she did for the 20th anniversary of VM. Uh, Melinda's presentations are very heavy on photos. Uh, so they're really fun. Uh, good stuff to read through. Uh, Chuck Boyer wrote the official IBM publication for the 40th anniversary of the mainframe, and it's a really good document. It's still up on the web. It's changed location several times over the last few years, and you can still download it from over again. Um, the IBM archives, if you want to find anything about IBM history, just go to ibm.com slash history. There is a ton of stuff there, and the main mainframe archives are massive. Interesting enough, they don't mention the 36067 at all. Got to look at the archive instead of get that page updated. Um, Bill wrote a great thing 10 years ago, which is still out there, obviously. Um, it's a lot of my old stuff from IBM is still out there on IBM pages. I have worked for IBM for six years, so I've been able to away. Um, Neil Ferguson wrote a really great paper for the G Journal. Unfortunately, that's no longer online. I found a copy last night, and I have put it up on my uh, Google search. My Google Drive page, so I will send Rich an updated version of the presentation with a link to that, so I'll send you that tonight. I found that last night after drinks and by the way, you didn't it last night. It was really good. <laughs> um, you kind of like a 13 minute drive. Um, uh, Bill Bender and Susan also did a brief history of VM, which is up there on the web. And there's a Wikipedia page on our VM. I always wanted to edit and go and say, you know, change the DM to say the real DM. <laughs> uh, as opposed to those people. Is it too black DM here? No, Broadcom. Uh, uh, I mentioned the VM function guy. Here's some really great articles. So I have a whole block more than just the one thing I did before retiring from my DM was downloading everything I could find. Uh, but there's some really great articles from way back. So this was journal uh, back in uh, 1970, which was from time sharing system. That's a historical thing. There's some other ones on the concept. The 1972 uh, volume 11 was all on the m 70 So I've got all the papers from that issue. There's a lot of fascinating pictures. I thought the concepts were great. There's an evolution one. Uh, Mike Bullshart wrote a great thing on the design of the REX language and why he developed it and how he developed it. And that's what he was great in history. Uh, Journal of Research and Development, Bob Creasy wrote one called The Origin of VM370, which has been a, a major source of history for the area. But the last one is one that I'm a real fan of, and that's IBM System 360 and early System 370 computers. Long out of print and hardcover. It's about this big guy's copy. But apparently, MIT Press has still a the software. It's a great book to read if you want to know what history because it tells you about all the products that failed from 1964 to 1974. So there were things like the IBM 1350. Have you heard of that one? If you remember, some of your the young people won't know what this means. Film strips, okay? The thing we had in school when we were young. And it actually was a machine that stored a terabyte of data. In the 60s. And it did it by writing the bits onto film, had a developer tank inside, developed the film, and stored the filming machine to read it back. I just sold six of them. Um, he <laughs> had yeah, a little problem like the developer leaking out on the floor and, uh, and other cute machines like a 2321. Any of you work with the 2321 data cell? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the noodle blocker. The noodle blocker. It had strips. Uh, you know, this was a predecessor to Mass Storage that used Amex, Amex, and a really fat videotape. And he would store it down vertically in this round thing, and then when you went to read it, it would wind them up. And when it tried to shift, shove them back in, it would often crumble them. So every customer who had one, the city of Toronto had one, had a resident SSR on site, service rep, to fix it. Because it broke every day. Another great product. Um,
<laughs> it, it, was, it was a really, really awful product. Uh, but it's an interesting history. You can find out about IBM mainframes that were developed and never released, like uh, the Model 60, this is Model 60, and so they put out the 65, uh, the 195, uh, some of the, uh, the 370, 195, which was a, not a 370 machine because it never had virtual storage, all of them were 370. So there's a lot of great history in there. Um, oh yes, they mentioned FS. So FS was, historically 360 was a total redesign of everything in computing. It was this compatible family of computers. You saw that picture yesterday of Tom Watson standing in Model 20. That thought was a great picture for that. But um, it was a compatible family system, but it broke with everything before. And so then I began coming along, three years later, we're developing future systems. This is going to replace System 360 completely, and it'll be a complete new architecture, and you have to redo everything again. Customer reaction to the weird hint of this was so negative, the 360 becomes so pervasive and compatible that I can pull it. Things in FS did end up in product, especially PS400, uh, which was basically very much uh, a grandchild of FS flat memory model. By the way, TSS had a flat memory model. All files were addressed in memory. It was just blocks of memory that's how it addressed it. Way before it's fine. Um, I got a couple of minutes. So in the chart deck here, there's all the other versions as well. But since we're on here, I figured it may as well tell the ugly history here. Uh, this slide up here. We so slide. Okay, so this. Uh, this is actually not that ugly history. It's just a fascinating thing. So IBM uh, had released the Linux 390 source code in December 1999. Uh, Marist College put it up. Rich downloaded it. <laughs> I mean, it just went nuts. People were, I just thought maybe a couple dozen people would download. There were 400 downloads in a couple of months. It took off. Frightened IBM executives. Really, really frightened IBM executives. It took off. So, uh, David Steinhoff, who was the product manager at the time, was going, We need to. The problem is that Linux had to run on CPs. And in those days, you didn't have subcapacity. There was none of the subcapacity software going into your thing size. So uh, uh, they said, okay, let's create this thing called Integrated Facility for Linux. It basically was an ICF, Integrated Coupling Facility, slightly modified so that you could run Linux and VM on it, um, but you couldn't run MVS or DOS. It's still MVS, you say, or OS, I guess, or DOS or any of that stuff. So it was a modified processor. Um, Instead, if we did have a customer discover, discover that they could, the IFL was cheap compared to the ICF, so that you could load a couple of the control code on an IFL. I'm going to fix that the next generation pretty quickly. Um, so they came up with this way of doing this. Now, the VM was the obvious thing to do this. You know, lots of guests and lots of Linuxes. VM was an MNLC product then. You know, you had to pay a lot of money for it. So we're talking about the VMESA at the time. And it was you know, tens of thousands of dollars a month. So um, they had a discussion with the pricing guys. And said, what can we do to make a cheap virtualization? Sorry, I'm so keep going. So, um, uh, so they came up with this thing called VIP, a stripped down version of VM that could sell at a one time charge. Kept on stripping on function until it got to a price point. Um, the reaction from customers was negative uh, because it was basically VM with all the good things taken up. And they went, no, no, we want VM. And so August 2000, IBM announces C architecture, announced DBM version 3, MLC product, same price as VMESA. And then a couple of months later, you know, uh, CBM version 4 as a one-time charge product, and quickly was through BIF. Uh, you will find no reference to BIF on IBM websites. I mean, we, we, I was working, potentially at the time, uh, 
heard with Glenn Beagle, and we went through this big exercise of actually deleting every funding, every web page that I began to reference virtual images so we could, let's just forget that ever happened. It's still like the BSD guys, SSX. But again, go and look at the announcement, uh, the whole presentation is lots of great history. If you have any questions, please drop me a note.